to talk today about David and Goliath, uh, one of my favorite stories in the Bible. Uh, I remember when I, was, when I was very young, okay, we're 55 years ago or so, uh, we uh, would go to church on Sunday morning, and then we would go to my grandmother's house for breakfast. That was the tradition. We'd go to Nani's house every Sunday morning for a little breakfast, because of course, Sunday the afternoon meal was like the major meal of the week, you know, so it was just a little breakfast at Nani's and then on to the next meal. But, uh, you know, as a kid, I remember that the adults could sit at the table and talk forever. And as a kid, this was pretty boring. And uh, so uh, they would say, well, why don't go, go outside and play? Well, there's nobody to play with on a Sunday morning. And, and they'd say, well, watch TV. And now, remember, this is millennia ago there were only like five TV stations, right, remember? And there was almost no programming on a Sunday morning. Sunday morning was like test pattern on TV. But there was a show called David and Goliath, if you remember. It was claymation, or early claymation, and it was a little boy and his dog, and they always, the little boy always got into these moral predicaments, and you know, the dog would always like, well, gee, Davy, I don't know, should you steal the apple pie kind of thing, you know? At least that's how I remember it, you know? And I love this show. I just thought this was the greatest thing. So when I got big enough to read, I couldn't wait to read the story of, of, of David in, in the Bible. Now, David is actually a very complex uh, kind of guy, and, and there are different schools of thought around him. He could be a historical figure, uh, or he could be a myth, or he could be an amalgamation of a number of different people. But what we know, what we believe about David is that David was a shepherd, uh, he slays, we know that he slays Goliath, he loves Bathsheba, um, and there's lots of political conspiracy taking place in his life. So David, interestingly enough, is considered the ancestor of the Messiah that the Hebrew people are waiting for. All right? And so his is the throne on which the Messiah will eventually sit. So David knows, uh, in, in the story, David knows that he's, uh, he's done some things, uh, and, and also... Uh, some things not so good in his journey. Uh, there are a number of the Psalms that are attributed to him, uh, but from Samuel, uh, we find the story of there's an army of Philistines on one hill and an army of Israelites on the other, and there's a valley between them. Now, Goliath, this giant of a warrior, uh, was a champion out of the Philistine camp, right? And uh, they said his height was six cubits and a span. So that translates as really honking big, okay? Uh, if he were in California, he would definitely run for governor, okay? Just because he's a big, big guy. Uh, he has a brass helmet, he's got armor, uh, and his challenge is that they will fight one-on-one. -on -one. So rather than the army against the army, it's gonna be one person from the Israelites and one person from the Philistines. The Philistines have Goliath the giant, and the Israelites are going to use little David here. Uh, so, uh, and the losers will serve the winners, okay? So now David's, he's a youth. He's a shepherd, right? Uh, and actually, he's not even there to fight. He dropped by to drop off some bread and cheese. He was like the local delivery kid, you know? If you had a Groupon or something like that, he was your guy. Uh, and so um, he disregards the notion of armor, young David does, and he takes a slingshot and five smooth stones. And David says, you know, thou comest to me with a sword, a spear, and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts. Right? So David says, you've got weapons, I've got God. Right? You've got armor, I have God. And so David shoots a stone into Goliath's forehead, ping, ping. And down goes Goliath, right? So I would say today, looking at the story, that Goliath is like an aggressive, domineering idea that is not the truth, you know, that's parading himself around prominently. Do you know what I mean when an idea comes into our life, something that's not the truth, a really strong appearance that could take us down the rabbit hole, not in a good way? You know, so Goliath represents appearances, the world of appearances, something big, possibly even overwhelming. Hmm? Uh, and David meets this error idea. You know, it's um, um, the mastery of the spiritual over the material world. 
Now, David's power was gained by trust in divine intelligence. So what does that sound like for us individually? I trust in God. I trust in God. I trust in God. Now, David did not just sit there. So he didn't say, I trust in God, and I'm just going to sit here. You know, he did his work. He prayed. He armed himself. He spoke his word. Now, we can overcome seemingly strong personal and material conditions when the mind of spirit is brought into action. In other words, when we call forth that presence and power of God that's within us, and remember, that which is within me is greater than that which is in the world. So Goliath could, um, could frighten other people very, very well. A big outer display of pomp, you know, when he's this huge warrior giant guy. Now, this is what I think is the key, is that David approaches Goliath in a very simple and inoffensive manner, which actually arouses the contempt of this giant and made him easy to kill. Right? So Goliath stood for his own strength, and David went forth to prove that there was a God in Israel. So we go forth in our life with the situations we have in front of us, this health episode, this job situation, this money situation, this relationship that's out of whack. We go forth in our life to prove the power of God, and we are guided in every way, and, and ultimately we are, in fact, the victor. You know, so there is a, a lure, it seems to me, of power and pomp to, to the one who does not make the effort to realize the greater spiritual truth, right? That truth that exists under all material manifestation. It's easy to be swayed by the bravado of the giant, right? That we meet adversity, though, with a direct declaration of truth. And what's that declaration of truth? You have no power over me. God in me is greater than this. This appearance is just an appearance. God is the only power and presence and activity in my life right now. So, you know, David becomes a king. I think of Mel Brooks when he says, it's good to be king. I won't say any more about that. But why is it good to be king? Because the king got to make the decisions. Right? The king is the person in power, authority, dominion. He makes the decisions. So how am I going to live today in order to create the tomorrow that I say I'm committed to having in my life? How do I live today to create the tomorrow that I say I'm committed to? What am I going to uh, stand for starting right now? Right now. You know, I notice what's important to me right now, and, and I have to think about, well, right, well, what is this same thing that's important to me right now, going to be important to me in the future? Will it be important to me six weeks from now? Will it be important to me tomorrow? Because, you know, time flies, right? And like David, I think we all, we all have dreams. We all have aspirations. We know we are here as spiritual beings on earth with something special and unique to do. That's true of every man, woman, and child, I believe. And so the power and intelligence of God in us is infinite. And yet, so often we barely use it. We sort of scratch the surface of this principal power and presence that exists within us. You know, the power and intelligence of God in us is infinite. Infinite. So if it's infinite, why do we barely use it? Now, I know we all have times when, when life seems, I hate to say unfair, but you know what I mean, unfair, uh, when every resource we have is called forward and we're pushed beyond our mortal limits, and in those situations, we have a choice. I will either be destroyed by this, or I will become better because of it. And it's up to us. And I know sometimes we ping pong back and forth, that it feels like I'm going to be destroyed. And then it's like, no, 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 I have to remember, I'm going to be better and stronger and more of the person I want to be because of this. No, 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 this is going to take me down the drain. No, 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 I'm better than that. I'm more than that. Lots of people live in spite of difficulties and adversity. You know, when you read and see the difficult things that people go through in life, I, I say to myself all the time, I have nothing to complain about. I mean, I, I have nothing to complain about. And it's not that everything is perfect the way I would like it to be, but just compared to the struggling and the suffering that many other people go through, as I become aware of that, I find that helps me have a, a perspective that calms me way down. Or as we say around our house a lot, we have first world problems. Yes, that's what we say. You know, uh, uh, 
uh, there was a woman, uh, her name was Candy Leitner, and she started mad, Mothers Against Drunk Driving. She took a tragedy, which was the death of her daughter, who was run over by a drunk driver, and she formed an organization that has saved thousands and thousands and thousands of lives over the years. So I want to suggest, like in David and Goliath, we can take any experience and make it work for us. Any experience, good can come out of that. I can do this. I'm here for God. You know, often we've talked about how we, uh, the conversation in our head is the most important conversation we're involved in on a daily basis, right? So how we talk to ourselves is enormously important. And then the action that we take out of that conversation that's taking place inside here. Uh, uh, in uh, a work by Itzhak Bentor called Stalking the Wild Pendulum, they did this interesting thing where they lined up a bunch of clocks with pendulums. Now, the thing was the pendulums all had to be the same length. But all the pendulums, are, all these clocks are lined up on the wall with pendulums the same length. And no matter how they started off, in a very short period of time, all the pendulums will swing in unison. Mm -hmm. And if you stop one and make it go out of sequence, very quickly it gets back into sequence with all the other pendulums on all the other clocks. So I think that's kind of like, like us in the company we keep. You know, that I think ideally we want to be around people who are seeing the best in us and supporting the best in us and calling forth the best in us, you know, and we do that for other people as well. Think about who do you want to be with in life? People who lift you up or people who tear you down? People who support you or people who don't? You know, people who are kind of about the business of living the way you're about the business of living, or maybe people who are not. You know, it seems to me that people who succeed do not have fewer problems than people who fail. Uh, I think the only people with no problems are probably in cemeteries. I don't know. <laughs> Again, it, science of mind would say to us, it's not what happens to us, it's how we see it and what we do with it that makes the difference. Mm -hmm. So I choose to believe that good can come from anything. Now, that doesn't mean I always get my way. It doesn't mean the good shows up right away. Sometimes it takes a long time for something that looks like fertilizer to uh, become something good. Yes, sometimes it just, it just takes time. Sometimes there is, there is a process there. So Thoreau said, things do not change. We change. Mm. And that, that's really science of mind to me. But you know, so one of the things I notice is that people who are doing well in life, people who are what we call successful or whatever that is, success leaves clues. You know, if you look at someone who's doing well, you can say, hmm, there must be, there must be, you know, it's, it's, it's like the story of Hansel and Gretel with the breadcrumbs left behind. You know, this is so, so with people who, are doing what we want to do or expressing the way we want to express. There are clues there. People do things to create the results they have. You know, they build and maintain a particular consciousness and do certain things again and again and again to maintain that consciousness in the world. If anyone can do it, be clear, you can do it, whatever it is. God has no favorites. We teach that in the science of mind. Every single person on the face of the earth is God's beloved child, right? So many would rather moan their situation than take action. Oh, the world won't do it for me. You're right. You're absolutely right. The world will not do it for you. So best to get up out of your recliner. You know, I need one of those eject me recliners that they have now <laughs> that just sort of like throw you up toward the TV. And, uh, uh, so if you ask yourself, who do you see in the world who's doing well in a way that you would like to embrace? Somebody who's really healthy, or somebody who's really happy, or somebody who has a wonderful relationship. Who do you see? Who do you see who has what you want? Can you learn from them? Or what, in particular, can you learn from them? So years ago, I remember I was at um, Asilomar, where we used to have our national conference up on the Monterey Peninsula. And a woman came up to me, uh, and she said, I like what you have. I want it. 
can you teach me? <laughs> and it's like, here, this is the Science of Mind textbook. Start with this, <laughs> you know? Um, but it, it, it's like, you know, why I bring that up is because, well, if you see somebody doing well, there are clues. They're, they're, you know, what they're doing is probably not nearly as mysterious as we have imagined it would be. And it has also been my experience that people who are doing well, people who are successful, are usually more than willing to share what they know. I think we make it up that like, oh, they're, I can't go ask them. Why would they want to tell me? Why would they want to share with me? Well, why wouldn't they? Remember, the knowledge alone is not enough. If that were so, if that were so, we would all have completely gotten it probably years and years and years ago. You've got to have action, too. This is why Ernest Holmes says you have to treat and move your feet. You cultivate the spiritual consciousness. You pray. You lift your thought. You remember you are one with the presence and power of God. And then you take action in the world. So ask yourself, what is, um, when we see someone doing well, what is that person's consciousness? And how do I build mine like that? How can I build a consciousness so that the good that they experience could also be the natural result of the consciousness that I cultivate? So I think there are a couple of clues. Um, and the first, I'd say, is our belief system. You have to believe you can. Right? If you don't believe you can be healed, if you don't believe you can meet a wonderful person, if you don't believe you can find work that pays you well, then how can that possibly happen? So the first thing is your belief system. You have to believe you can. The second thing, I think, is our self-talk. Now, I'm a big fan of this. I think this is enormously important. You have to affirm yourself up all the time, every day. I, you know, this conversation is going on. I, I, I joke about this all the time. I say, you know, from the time I wake up in the morning to the time I go to bed at night, the committee's in session. And if I get up in the middle of the night, it's amazing to me, they've called an emergency meeting. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, it's 3 o'clock in the morning, and it's like, oh, my God, the committee's here. I thought I was just going to get up and go to the bathroom quickly. No. Da, 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 da. It's like they were waiting for me. They were waiting for me. So your self-talk is extraordinarily important. And the last part is this that I love about the science of mind is that we get to act as if. You know, that, because if you act as if, that will only lift you up. How would I feel if I were in a wonderful, loving relationship? How would I feel if I had work that I absolutely loved? How would I speak to other people? How would I speak to myself? What kind of thoughts would I be thinking? You know, I mean, it, it, and people say, well, I'm just not very good at the acting as if. OK, here, I'll teach you right now how. Breathe. Right? So that's the first part. We breathe. Now on the next breath, take a good feeling into your body. So breathe again and have a good feeling in your body. And now let your face know on the next breath, you know? So take a third breath and it's like, oh yeah, OK, OK. Because you know, your subjective mind doesn't know the difference between real or imagined. It just knows what you focus on. And when you focus on it and focus on it and focus on it, your subjective mind sets about creating that. So you're David. I'm David. All of us are David in the story. And I don't know what your giant is. I don't know what the Goliath in your life is. But if you're here on Earth, you probably got a little Goliath going on. Mm -hmm. And I think you have, we all have, what it takes to be victorious over whatever it is that is before us. So remember, believe you can, affirm yourself up, you know, and act as if. Let's pray. Thank you. So we turn our attention inward for a moment to remember that we are surrounded and filled with God's infinite loving spirit. God's peace, God's power, God's presence is right here. It's the most true and most real thing about each and every one of us. And so in this awareness of our connection with God, our connection with spirit, our connection with the infinite, I speak the word for each and every one today. I speak the word that we are David and we are armed with the awareness of our oneness with God. And all power stems from this. And I claim for each and every one of us that whatever Goliath we are facing in our life, whether it's an idea or a person or a situation, whatever it may be, I claim for us that that spirit of God within us is greater than that. And we have everything we need to move beyond any seeming difficulty or challenge. I know that power of God within us is infinite in its ability. And I know we are infinite in our ability to use and express it. 
So I claim for each and every one of us today absolute perfect healing, overcoming of seeming obstacles and difficulties. We include in our prayer today our family members and friends, our parents and children, all of those we hold near and dear, and we know that right where they are, God is present, surrounding them, filling them, healing, uplifting. We let our prayer be a blessing in the world, a world that provides us with so many opportunities to be convinced that the appearances are real. And so we join in consciousness and know that beyond all appearances, there is a spiritual truth that makes us more and more free. And we focus on that truth and we send an energy of love and peace and blessing all over our globe, touching all people everywhere. We bless our church. We bless all churches, synagogues, temples, mosques, ashrams, all paths to God. And I'm certain that we are blessed by being together, that there is raising up and there is healing for everyone. And so with a full heart, I give thanks that this is the truth. It could not be any other way, and so it is. Together we all say, Amen.